I'm lucky I'm from Chicago. Had I been from one or the other, it would have been a, you know, I would have really caught it. But, you know, it was a chance of a lifetime to be a GM. And so I took it. Uh, I, I didn't take it easily. I, I took it with a lot of, a lot of tears, actually, because I, I love working for Peter and Larry and, and, and Saves. And, um, Do you remember the day you told Saves you were going to the Dodgers? I remember the whole scenario very well. Um, Peter called me in on a Thursday night, and he said, uh, and he was, look at, he was in the, in the corner office. As you look up from the Willie May statue, that first office you see on the corner was Peter's office. Larry was the next one. I was the next one. And Brian was the next one. And um, he called me in on a Thursday night and maybe November 2nd or 3rd, something like that. And said, um, uh, I got bad news. And I thought, oh my gosh, what, what could be the bad news? And I thought, you know, because Barry was, was in, a, in the midst of some different, different things going on. I thought it had something to do with Barry. And so I said, what's up with Barry? And he goes, Barry, it's got nothing to do with Barry. This is, this is you. I said, me, what did I do? You know? And he says, I got bad news. Uh, Frank McCourt's called asking for permission to talk to you. And I thought, what's the bad news? You know? And, <laughs> yeah. Uh, sounds good to me. Well, yeah. And uh, cause I had, you know, I had, Peter actually had not told me about one opportunity I had in the NL East. And then, um, you know, I found out about it, and so we made a deal that he would tell me from then on. And then I had a conversation with Cincinnati uh, under the guise that I would not take the job if offered, but I would have the experience of interviewing for it. Um, so I had done that in 03, and now we're in November of 05. And um, he says, this is, you know, I got bad news. He said, I'd rather have you go to Oakland than go to the Dodgers. I can't have you go to the Dodgers. I said, well, Peter, you know, I mean, there's only 30 jobs like this. And he says, yeah, but, you know, it's the Dodgers. And, you know, and, you know, when, you know, when Saves is done, you know, you're going to be the GM. And I thought, well, you know, Saves is my buddy. I don't want nothing happening to Saves. So, you know, it's kind of like that's, you know, that's not something I'm looking forward to. And um, so he says, so what do you want to do? I said, well, I'd like to talk to him. And he says, all right, all right. So. He says, why don't you talk to Frank tomorrow on the phone? And if you still want to talk to him, come and, you know, let me know. So I talked to Frank for 10 minutes on the Friday. And I said, Peter, I'd like to at least interview, you know. And um, it was it was, the middle of November, it was the middle of November by the time I got the gig. So this may have been early, the first week of November, and it's this Thursday night. And, uh, and so Peter gave me permission. But he didn't give me permission until another week went by hoping that the calendar would play against me having the opportunity, I guess. Um, and so I interviewed with Frank on a Friday. I came back. Back then you had you had three days. A team had to ask permission, as they still do. And then a t- the team that asked for permission had 72 hours to interview and make its decision. Kind of archaic in a way when you think about it. Jobs this big that you'd only have three days to interview somebody and then make a decision on them. Um, but that's how it was. So I interview on Friday uh, after the GM meetings were in Palm Springs. I drove up to LA. Saves and Dick Tidro flew back. It was, it was weird. Saves knew I was interviewing. I mean, he was, you know, aware of everything. And um, it was weird having dinner with two guys I loved and, and Dick Tidro and Brian, uh, knowing I, at the end of the week I was interviewing for the job for Dodger gig, you know, like kind of a weird deal. But the interview on Friday with uh, with Frank and Jamie McCourt, about eight or nine hours. Flew back to San Francisco uh, late at night, the last flight out. Um, got here, and I remember on Saturday, um, I, wasn't, uh, I wasn't a big wine drinker. Um, now I would love to live in San Francisco and go up <laughs> to Napa, Napa, you know. Um, I probably went three or four times in my 11 years there. And, uh, but I went up to buy a case of wine because Brian was getting married to Amanda a week later. And so I went and got a case of wine for him and, um, as a wedding gift. And on, on Saturday, that was Saturday, um, I called Peter on Sunday and he picked the phone up and he says, don't tell me you took the job. I says, I haven't been offered the job. I said, but you know, if, if for some reason I get a call tonight or first thing tomorrow, you know, you, you don't give two weeks notice. 
one minute you're a giant, the next minute you're a dodger. So there's no going away part. I mean, there's nothing. It just, it just, boom, you're done. And I says, you know, I've been here for a long time and I love it here. And, you know, we've been through a lot. We went through the candlestick days. We went through the, you know, then the park, you know, the Pac Bell transition. And we went from trying to draw 2 million people. Candlestick drew 2 million people, 2 million, three times in 40 years to drawing over 3 million and having great teams in a World Series team in 02 that got beat and all these great memories. I said, you know, I might be sentimental or melancholy, whatever, but, you know, I want to spend some time with you. And um, he says, come in tomorrow. It was a Monday. Come in tomorrow at 6. I thought, oh, geez, 6. Okay. So I meet him at 6 o'clock in the morning on a Monday, like probably November 13th of 05. And um, we talked for an hour or so. And he's saying, you know, even if this guy calls, you shouldn't, you shouldn't go, you shouldn't go, you shouldn't go. And I, I said, you know, he, and he kept saying, you know, when, when Saves is done, you're the guy. I said, but, you know, when's that going to be? And I don't want it to be soon because I love Saves, you know. And so uh, I talked to him. I talked to Larry for a while. And then Saves and I talked. And, um, you know, we, we talked about a lot of good times we had. And I, I didn't know if I was even going to get another call back. And during that conversation, Frank called me and he says, he's still interested. I says, yeah. He goes, why don't you come down for one more day? I said, well, you're going to have to get permission for one more day. And so he called Peter uh, and Peter came into my office and he said, Frank just called. He needs one more day to talk to you. He said, I don't have to do that. I gave you the three days. He's up at noon. That's it. And I says, Peter, after all of this time, you know, you're going to, you know, it was a technicality against me having this chance. And, and he says, no, nah, I can't do that to you. But, you know, I says, well, let me go. So I flew down and I got there about noon and um, started about one o'clock, finished about one o'clock in the morning. It was nonstop. Uh, Frank, 12 before, hours. Huh? Oh, oh, it was it was like a heavyweight fight. And um, and Frank asked me the next day. I mean, I, I didn't have. Uh, maybe too much detail here. I, you know, I, I think I owned one suit. You know, Saves and I, we were leather jackets. You know, we wore leather jackets at night at the ballpark. And on the Saturday or Sunday day game, we wore a Tommy Bahama shirt. You know, I mean, that, that, was, our, that was our wardrobe, you know. So I had a sport coat and I had a suit. That's all I had when it came down to that type of, of wardrobe. So I got it packed in a little bag, right, and I fly down there. On Monday, I get there about noon. Frank picks me up. We go to the Beverly Hills Hotel. And I got a sport coat on with like a sweater and uh, nice slacks and my typical cowboy boots, right? And um, I'm sweating. I'm sweating. It's as hot as can be in this hotel suite, three-room suite. And there's no lunch. There's, no, there's nothing. There's no food. There's water. And it's nonstop. Frank McCourt, one of the smartest toughest negotiators ever been around and he keeps going and going and going. And I had a lot of questions too, because I had a, I loved where I was at. Sure. You were in a good spot. You were in a position of strength. Yeah. I, I was, it was probably the only place I would have went to there or maybe home to the Cubs, but you know, I didn't have really any interest in leaving. Um, then again, you know, you work for the opportunity to be one of 30. Um, so at, uh, we get to about one in the morning and, um, he says, all right, uh, I got till noon now. We had till noon Tuesday. Peter gave 24 more hours. And so he says, well, we got till noon. I says, yeah, and we're not going to get a minute after noon. I can tell you that. And he goes, all right, I'll meet you back here at 6. I said, good. He goes, let's go. I says, what do you mean let's go? And he goes, he goes, well, you're not staying here. I says, what do you mean I'm not staying here? We're standing outside the, the, the suite at the Beverly Hills Hotel. Happened to be the Rat, Rat Pack suite from years ago with Sinatra. Really? Yeah, I mean, I, I found that out the next day. But he was, you know, we were arguing out in the hallway where I was staying. You know, I'd been to L.A., you know, a hundred times. But, you know, you're always going to the team hotel. You're going to L.A. Actually, you're going to Dodger Stadium. I don't know Beverly Hills. But, and there's no Uber. So what am I going to do? I'm going to go out on, on to, you know, what's it on Sunset, I think. He's going to go out there on, on the street corner. It's in a residential neighborhood. There's no taxi cabs going by. And where's he, where's he taking me? I don't have a hotel room, you know. So Frank acquiesces like at 1.30 and says, all right, I'll meet, you know, you can stay here. I'll meet you back here at 6. 
So the next day he meets me back like 10 to six, knocking on the door, like fresh as a daisy. Guy's got, you know, great, great mind and also stamina, right? So this is like the seventh game of the World Series for me personally. And so he comes in and we sit there and he says, uh, uh, how do you think yesterday went? I said, it was fine, you know. And uh, he goes, did you have an early day? I said, well, yeah, I met with, with Peter McGowan at six in the morning. And he goes, oh, yeah. And then I kept you up late. He goes, uh, did you have any concerns when the day was done? I says, no, not really. And he goes, you had none, huh? And I said, well, yeah, I guess I had one. I said, I, I hope that I could sleep a couple hours because, you know, I was geared up. I said, we talked from 12. And I, I needed to get a couple hours of sleep because today's a big day for both of us. And I said, why do you keep asking me? And he says, well, I'll tell you why. He says, when you came in here yesterday, when I picked you up, I knew when I was picking you up, you were going to wear a sport coat and you know, you're going to look presentable. And if you remember what I was wearing, I was wearing short sleeves. I says, yeah. He goes, and I had the hotel put the heat up full. Okay. <laughs> and, and by design, we didn't have a meal. And by design, at the end of the night, you were always going to stay in here. But I wanted to see if you were going to fight for what was right. Or if you were going to say, well, this is the guy that's going to make a decision on hiring me. So, you know, I'll have to walk around the neighborhood for four hours or something. <laughs> and, and he said, but, you know, you, I said, well, how do I do? He goes, he goes, you did great. He says, you were exhausted. I was exhausted. Let's see where we go. So now we talk and we talk and we talk. And I knew I knew at um at noon that it was going to be one way or the other. And about 1120, he offers me the job and he offers me a salary. I knew what my predecessor had made and I knew Paul my, Podesta, right? Yeah. I knew, I knew Paul had a five year deal and I knew that after two years I was sitting there, right? He, he had worked two of the five and was going to be paid for another three. So, uh, you know, Frank offers me three years at uh, less money than Paul was making. And, you know, I grew up in a garage, okay? Blue collar family, wonderful parents. Um, so I would say what anybody would say who grew up in the humbleness of, of how my, my family lived. I got up, I closed my briefcase, I shook his hand, I said, thanks for everything, you got the wrong guy. And he says, you're, you're, not, you're not taking the, the gig as a GM of the Dodgers? I says, no. I says, you, you paid my predecessor. You're going to pay me for the same amount of time as my predecessor who's not getting, who's not doing this job and who you decided to replace. And you're going to pay me less than my predecessor. I said, you got the wrong guy. I got a good gig. And he goes, what's it going to take? And I said, it's going to take a fourth year. And it's going to take, I said, the first year you can pay me a little less. The second year I got to make what he was making. And the third year, a little more. In the fourth year, a little more than the third. And he goes, okay. And he says, um, now it's like it's like quarter to 12 now, right? We got like 15 minutes. And he says, um, I'll do that if you give me an option on the fifth year. Now, and I, and I teach at Pepperdine, I teach a class on negotiation. When I said no, I got I got to go back a minute. When I said no at like eleven thirty ish, I said no in the in like a split second of thinking about this. I knew what day it was. It was November fifteenth. Okay, the season been over for six weeks. I knew that they didn't have a manager. They let Jim Tracy go. They had no coaching staff. I knew that he called me back. Okay, I, I mean all these things. As as I decided to get up and shake his hand and say, "Thanks, but you got the wrong guy." came in, you know, you got to have leverage and you have to know your surroundings and know your situation. So all these things, I just, you know, in an instant, and I'm, I'm far from the smartest guy ever in any room, but I grew up in the street and I had to figure out how to, how to hustle and how to, how to read people. I knew that I knew he was serious. And I knew that he wanted me. Otherwise he wouldn't have brought me there a second time. He wouldn't have spent all that time talking to me. He knew what day it was the middle of November. He knew it's been six weeks. Without he knew the team was seventy one and ninety one that was that you know I was going to inherit if I took it you know, the second worst team since World War II for that franchise there was a lot of work to be done like now and they were six weeks behind so that's when I said no 
So now we, we get to the, the last part of it. He says, you know, if you give me a, cl- a club option on the fifth year, I'll do what you're asking. I says, and this is another key thing. Most people would say, yeah, sure, whatever you want. Fifth year option, who cares? But I, I, I thought for a second, I thought, you know what? He wants me. I says, why don't we both have an option on the fifth year so we can both say no? We both have to say yes for me to stay for five. And he goes, why would you do that? I says, because we're going to be okay, Frank. We're going to win. We're going to be successful. And maybe after four years, I want to do something else or go someplace else. So you shouldn't have the only right to say yes or no. So he goes, oh, yeah, all right. And, and so we do the deal. So I call, I call Peter and Larry right at like a minute to 12. And, um, you know, I called Saves and I says, you know, I'm leaving. I'll, I'll see it. I'll see it tomorrow. And, you know, we'll talk about it. But one more thing about the negotiation piece, the fifth year club option that I turned into a mutual option. Nobody knows what's happening tomorrow, let alone five years from now. Okay. Here's how it turned out. It turned out to be one of the most important things I negotiated in the deal was not saying yes to just a simple club option after four years. Because after four years, we had won. They've gone to the playoffs three out of four years, off a 71 and 91 team. We went to the playoffs my first year. We won 88, went from 71 wins to 88. Second year, not as good. Third year, LCS against Philly. Fourth year, LCS against Philly. In the meantime, he and his wife are starting to have issues. Their, their marriage starting to get in a tough spot. Uh, within a year or so, they're filing bankruptcy, filed for divorce, end up getting divorced. Um, when we got to the end of the fourth year, he came to me and he said, I have great news for you. I'm going to pick up the option on the fifth year. We, we won three out of four and been to the LCS twice. And I said, I have better news for me. And he goes, what's that? I says, I'm turning it down. I'm either going to have a long-term deal with you going forward or I'll go someplace else. And so we worked out a three-year deal with a couple more option years, which, as it turned out, brought me – was a bridge to a few years – with the new ownership group. And, you know, they could have fired me as soon as they got there. Guggenheim with Caston and all yeah. those guys. They could have fired me as soon as they got there. But, you know, they were doing, you know, they were inheriting, you know, a decent club. You know, our, our 210 team, I think, was the only time I was under 500 there. I was under 500 by a game. Um, and then 11, you know, the bankruptcy and all these things, they took over on May 1st of 212. Uh, we rebuilt the team on the fly. I think we acquired 11 or 12 players in, in July and August. Um, and I think we got eliminated the next to the last day of the season from the wild card. And the Giants went on to, to win the series. 13, we go to the LCS. 14, we go to the division. And 15, I go start doing TV, you know. So, you know, it, it, it was a, a smart thing for me to say no to that fifth-year club option. Because I would have been a lame duck. I would have been sitting there as the whole thing started to crumble. Uh, and therefore, I had a chance to rebuild it a little bit and work for Guggenheim for you know, nine years, I guess, two as a GM or three as a GM and, and uh, six or seven TV. 